ready? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, good to see y'all again, or I guess I have to say glad y'all can see me again. Uh, we're grateful, thankful to God just for this, uh, this opportunity to uh, be on as we are. We know we're in a, in a time of change and it's in a season of change. Hey, it says, how you doing? How you doing, Ansys? Fine, how you doing, hey? Good, do it good. good. Uh, it's off the screen from here, fellas. Uh, no, no, I'm getting ready to, uh, I'm getting ready to mute you, and so uh, y'all just listen in, and those who are listening in uh, from the conference line, if uh, once I mute you, and maybe if you have a question or a comment that you want to make to something, um, Press the star, the, the, little, yeah, the little icon on your phone that looked like a star. Press star right. six, and that will allow you to make a comment if you want to make a comment, okay? Oh, okay. So All right, then. I'll let y'all know what to do. Thank y'all so much. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. All participants are muted, and All they right. can unmute themselves. <clears throat> again, for those of you that are watching in this morning thank you again for your uh, for your presence and for your uh, for your participation in terms of what we're doing uh, as it relates to our study for today we are uh, about a minute away from us actually uh, starting off so just in advance gonna say if there are any questions uh, that you have about anything don't don't hesitate to uh uh, ask your questions. We uh, want to address as many as we possibly can uh, for the time that we have. We norm normally actually don't normally have morning Bible study on this particular Wednesday, but you know, since God is allowing us all this freedom and and allowing us all these various opportunities, I just want to take advantage of it and uh, just be able to use the uh, the time, if you would. I gotta I feel like I got a lot of extra time on my hand. Uh, so I just want to use the time just to be able to share the word of God uh, with those who uh, uh, would uh, choose to uh, to listen. Now, there are some of you who are looking at it and you think it's too dark. I got these uh, these wonderful directors and producers in here. If you think it's too dark, you let me know, and we're gonna we're gonna make it a little more brighter uh, in here. Uh, you know how to communicate that. If you want to do that, feel free to do that, uh, please, ma'am, and please, sir. Well, we're gonna go ahead and start our time together on, on today. And, uh, but what I always do, uh, start with a word of prayer. Uh, last night, I want to thank you for members for uh, calling in in the uh, prayer time on last night. Many of you called in, and it was certainly a blessing uh, to uh, be with you all and to hear all of the voices. Uh, I was definitely grateful for the prayer, but, but I got all excited at the end, you know, when we... Uh, uh, when I unmuted everybody and everybody could talk and everybody was saying goodbye and all of that, that was just as absolutely exciting. Again, this was on Monday evening. And, of course, our women met on uh, yesterday by way of a conference call and uh, and drill stamps had an opportunity to share the word of God. Now, I'm got, I got to sound like pastor when I say this. Um, some of you should have been on the call last night. More women should have been on the call than what was on the call. Um, remember, we're still the church. And though we're in this pandemic, uh, we still have responsibilities. And that is for us to study the word together, uh, to know the word of God together. So those things that we uh, are asking us to do, and I'm saying that as your pastor, those things that we're asking uh, for us to do as members of the body of Christ, members of the Good Shepherd Church in particular, let's do that. Uh, the Bible clearly says you obey those that have rule over you. So we're making those opportunities for the study of the word of God, some practical things that you're going to need. Uh, and it has nothing to do with this, with the pandemic and the like. No vacation from the word of God. So keep that in mind. Uh, so I want to encourage those of you who didn't come on uh, last this past Tuesday uh, when we make those announcements that the women, the conference is going to be on for women having Bible study together. You need to participate. Same thing, say for the guys uh, that's going to happen uh, on tonight. We are praying for uh, Sister Barbara Matthews. I know we often refer to her as Barbara Wilson, but she we want to respect to her. Her, who she is as a wife, her husband, Carl. Uh, we want to uh, refer to Barbara Matthews and pray for her. Her father uh, passed away, died, and we want to be praying for her and uh, for her for siblings, her family, 
um, uh, that God would just give them comfort in this season. Uh, we do know that Sister Betty Savannah appears to be getting better, and so we praise God for that and uh, seeing what's taking place in, uh, in her life. And again, we continue praying for the issues that's going on all over the world, uh, not just the issue of the coronavirus and people who are dealing with the COVID-19 for his deaths and the like of concern, but there are people just issues that are going on in life uh, that are happening, uh, that are still taking place. And we want to continue praying uh, for our, uh, our loved ones, even people that we don't know, they're loved by somebody. And so we always want to, uh, to keep that uppermost in mind. So let's pause for just a moment. We're going to go to God in prayer. And uh, then we're going to just jump into what we're going to be doing for, uh, for the rest of the hour that God gives us on this day. Heavenly Father, we uh, pause right now to say thank you for being the great and awesome God that you are. It uh, has been evident to us ever since we've existed that uh, we have a need to depend on you, to rely upon you, to uh, know that there's nobody else who can do for us what you do. And so we are grateful, Lord, that you've given us the sense to know that our life is in your hands, uh, that we can't breathe without you, we can't move without you, we can't think without you. Uh, everything, everything about us is dependent upon you. And so thank you, God, for giving us your Holy Spirit who, has helped us to, who helps us to know uh, of our need for you, uh, helps us to know the way to understand you, uh, to understand your word, to understand your voice, to understand your will, uh, to understand your way for our life. God, thank you so much uh, for uh, your Holy Spirit who lives in us, uh, so that we can clearly know the things of God, uh, because the things you say are so spiritually uh, appraised. And so, Father, as we uh, bow before you today, we are grateful and thankful again for life as we know it. And we are mindful, you said, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. So we thank you, God, for everything uh, that you are and everything that you allow us to, uh, to know. Um, and so we rush, as always, to ask that you would forgive us of our sins and the fact that we do know you, that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present. You are sovereign. You are in control of everything. But, Lord, forgive us for those moments and minutes in life uh, when we act like we don't know you, when we act like you don't exist, when we talk like you don't exist, when we think as though you don't exist. Lord, forgive us uh, for those times we act independent of you and we choose to do our own thing and and think that some way, somehow, we, we're, we're running things. But God, thank you for knowing that you said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us, and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And we count on that forgiveness, and we count on the fact that you are the one who cleanses us. And so even this morning, as we bow before you, we have been praying, as you know. You have been hearing our prayers all over the world, all seven continents where there are believers that have been praying to you. Uh, we know you're hearing us, God, and so we, we ask again that you would help us to always be mindful that ultimately it's your will that we desire to be done. It's your kingdom with that we desire to come. And so in light of that, we want to pray for Barbara Matthews and her family, uh, those uh, moments and minutes that they're dealing with bereavement of their father. I pray, God, for comfort in her heart, comfort in, with her sister, her brother. I pray, God for the other grandchildren. I pray you just continue to meet them at the point of their needs. Uh, we pray again for those friends and, and loved ones that uh, are grieving at, at his loss. And we just, we just ask, Lord, you continue to keep that family, not only that family, but every family uh, that is going through death, um, um, whether it's the COVID-19, whether it's just the natural things that are happening, the sad things that are happening in our world, the deaths, the by murder, the accidents that are still happening, the surgeries that uh, go bad, and all of those things that are still going on in our world. We, uh, we pray for families that are in bereavement and sorrow and, and grief even now. Uh, we certainly want to uh, thank you for Sister Betty Savannah and how you're uh, enriching her life and encouraging her and edifying her and, and building her back up. God, we pray that you would just grant her the most natural thing she needs right now, and that's the ability to, to eat. Uh, so with that you would give her that appetite, Father. Again, we ask that you would do it according to your will. So for every member of this congregation, from Sister Philomena Thomas uh, to, the, to the baby yet in Tanisha's body, 
fairly God. We pray that you continue to uh, meet us at the point of our needs. Grant to us those things that we, we, we know we need. We know that you are, are the heart fixer. We know you're the mind regulator. We know, God, uh, you know every, every hair on our head. And so thank you for knowing us that way. And so for every member of our congregation, for members of other congregations, every church, though, that is open in your name on the seven continents of the world, we, we ask, Lord, that you continue to allow us to know that you're God and that you're good and that your grace is always sufficient for us, no matter what the need, no matter what the test, no matter what the trial. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thank you all so much for your uh, participation on this morning. Uh, I did say to Stefan and to um, uh, Zach, wanted to allow for a time, if possible, to kind of create a setting uh, this morning that would allow for uh, questions and answers. Uh, if anyone had a, had a question from the Bible, we wanted to address uh, any of those questions that you may have, do our best to address them. Uh, if we don't know it, we'll admit that we don't know it, but always can... Uh, uh, I, I, got, I got my phone right here, so I could always dial in Philip. I could always dial in Terrence, uh, some other pastor that I may know, just to be able to get the answer uh, to any questions and the like that, uh, that, you, may, uh, that you may have. So, uh, Stefan, uh, Zach, any, any, anybody called in any questions yet, uh, as far as you know? Um, and if so, go ahead and uh, ask. No, no one asked any, any calls yet? All right. Well, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Um, one of the things that I've, I've learned or encouraging us to learn or to know uh, as, it relates to, uh, the, uh, as it relates to the word of God, a very, very important thing for us to, uh, to keep in mind is that everything that we need, even in terms of what's going on with us right now, we can find it all in the word of God. The answer for us is always in the word of God. There's nothing... Uh, that's happening right now. There's nothing that has ever happened in your life. Uh, there's no situation, no circumstance, no detail of your life that God has not given an answer to. He's got an answer for every single thing. And we know that just on the basis of the word uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful passage. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. And if those of you that are listening you want to turn there in your Bible, don't forget again, you still want to answer a question, ask a question, don't hesitate. If you're doing it by way of, uh, of uh, the Facebook Live, uh, you know, you can type the question in, whatever way you need to do it. Uh, for those of you that are listening by way of the, uh, the conference call, you can always press star six, the uh, little star icon on your telephone, and six, and that will allow you to, uh, to say, hey, Pastor, I got a question. Hey, Pastor, I got a comment. Hey, Pastor, uh, I, I, I would like to say something, whatever it may be. This is kind of a free time for us. So I want you to feel free to do that. Uh, don't feel so formal. Don't feel so um, not locked in that you can't do it. Feel free to do it. Uh, I, want, I want to encourage everybody, please, ma'am, and please, sir. But Second Peter chapter 1. Uh, and the verses are verse 19 to 21. I'm always interested in that verse. And it actually says, and so we have, we have the prophetic word confirmed. This is uh, Peter who is uh, speaking. Uh, and again, we clear, we, we know Peter's relationship with Jesus Christ and, uh, and how he knew Christ so well. Uh, he was one of the, uh, the 12. He was one of the, the three that was close to Jesus even after resurrection, we know he's the one that Jesus had to challenge and ask him, Peter, do you love me? And so we're familiar with this character. He says, and so we have the prophetic word confirm, which he says to us who are believers, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know about the word of God, that regardless to uh, all of the darkness that's around us right now, all of the issues that we're dealing with in life, even now with the COVID-19 that's going on, the pandemic all over the world, we can go to the word, and the word of God, and the word of God sheds light on every situation. It sheds light on every circumstance. So it doesn't matter where I am, the word of God has an answer for me. So he reminds us, he says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, 
And that, that's how long, in other words, he said that we can count on that word at all times. We can depend on God's word at all times. So it doesn't matter what the midnight of your life may be. It doesn't matter if it's three o'clock in the morning. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, uh, what's where you are, what state you're in. It doesn't matter what city you're in. It doesn't matter what county you're in. It doesn't matter whose house you're in. The word of God is always present. It's always prevalent. It's always necessary. And it has a way, again, of just, just being a source of encouragement, uh, no matter what the situation may be. Uh, you can be down. You can be out. I mean, you can be feeling real bad about some things. But when you go to the Word of God, God has a, 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 a word, in uh, uh, an answer, if you would, to whatever your situation may be. And I know sometimes that sometimes that we, you know, we, we, uh, we go through circumstances. And I know I've done that. I've done that in the past. I don't do it as much right now. But there have been some times I just open up my Bible, just open it up and kind of like wherever it opened up, I just started reading. And some way, somehow, just in that, that just that little uh, uh, element, that little thing that I chose to do just to uh, testing something, trying something out, I'm, I'm looking for what it, whatever it was. I can even call it something I'm doing from a humorous standpoint. But, but some way, somehow, that was the answer that I needed. Uh, that was the answer uh, to whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, some way, somehow it encouraged, some way, somehow it edified. Now, here's one of the things that important to keep in mind about the word of God. It says in chapter, in verse 20 of Second Peter chapter 1, that's what we're looking at. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. I love that. And he's talking about the fact that, you know, when God gave the word to the prophets in particular, uh, when we look at uh, Moses, uh, we look at Samuel, uh, we have David, uh, Jeremiah, we got Isaiah, um, you got um, Hosea, Joel, you know, Amos, Obadiah, you got Daniel, you got Ezekiel, you got all of those prophets that God gave his word to. Uh, these, these men did not interpret God's word based upon their own private view. It wasn't like, uh, you know, this, they're, 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 they're writing down, in other words, I believe this is what I think God is talking about. It wasn't that kind of thing. Uh, these men, uh, they, were, they were aware of situations and circumstances that were going on uh, in the life of Israel, in the life of the people of Judah. And they wrote from the perspective of what was taking place in the life of the nation, not only in the life of the nation of Israel, but in the life of nations all around them. So these weren't, these weren't people who were, you know, like living on one continent, uh, learning something, something happening on another continent. No, they were living where they were. They were operating where they were. They were aware of the times that they were living in. And so God used them to do what? To write the word of God uh, based upon where they are, based upon the things that they were currently experiencing, based upon things that God wanted them to know even as far as their history were concerned. So they wrote, they wrote from that perspective. It was not a private interpretation. They weren't coming up with their own ideas, their own opinions. Uh, these, weren't, these weren't what we call today the talking heads. In other words, uh, that, there's a lot, lot of talk that we hear, whether it's CNN or NBC, ABC, uh, whatever, whatever your network may be. There's a lot that they're saying, but a lot of times, a lot of stuff they're saying, it's opinion. It's, it's, it's what we, it, you know, this is what I think I see, and this is what's going on. Yeah, are there some things that we're getting some facts and all of that? Absolutely, but those facts are based upon that big word we hear right now on data, data, that sort of thing. And so the prophets of that time, that's probably more what they did. They had data. They had real life data before them. They were seeing what was going on. And so God now, uh, through the Holy Spirit, gives them the ability to write what God wanted them to know about him, what he was doing in that time, and what he was going to do uh, for those who chose to live according to what he said, what he was going to do with those who chose not to live. You know, blessed is the man who walks not, he says, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight what is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night, and he would be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose fruit, who provides fruit in, in its season he says but the ungodly are not so so what he was looking at is the fact that they're going to perish because they were not going to
to stand in the judgment of God. So what he would, would, would point out that there were those who chose to live godly, there were chose, those who lived to, chose to live ungodly, and God would allow those prophets to write, to see what's going on, and to write in such a way that they would respond to what was going on with people during that time and they would write it, preserve it for us as the word of God today. So it was not based upon private interpretation. Well, we come to the New Testament. We get to the New Testament. Who do we have? We have Peter. We got James. We've got John. We've got Paul. Uh, we've got Matthew. We've got, we got Mark. We've got Luke. We've got all of these that are writing. And they are not writing, again, from the perspective of a private interpretation. What they got, they got it from God. Ultimately, uh, we would say they got it really from the spirit of Jesus Christ uh, because he would remind us in Hebrews chapter 13, right? He says, Jesus Christ, what is the same yesterday, today, and forever? So what we're to do, we're to obey the pastors that God has given us to teach us and preach to us the word of God because at the end of the day, the pastor understands that what he has is not a private interpretation. He didn't, he didn't, or we're not supposed to anyway, kind of come up with our own ideas, our own thoughts, because notice what he reminds us in verse 21, first Peter, I'm sorry, second Peter chapter two, chapter one, I'm at verse 21 now. He says, for prophecy never came by the will of man, prophecy, uh, uh, to speak forth what God has said. Uh, some things are foretelling of what God had said. But for the most part, it's to speak forth what God has already said. So the prophecy, he says, did, never came by the will of man. It's not like, again, Isaiah thought about all of the stuff. You know, I want to write something to Israel. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, Jeremiah decided, look, I need to write this to Judah. no. They didn't do this on their own will. It wasn't like John decided, I just want to write about Jesus being the word of God and, and the word be made, was made flesh and dwelt among. That, that's, that's not how this went. God orchestrated it uh, for the prophecy never came by the will of God, by the will of man. But watch this. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Oh, what it says, they spoke from God. They spoke from the perspective of God. They spoke according to the spirit of God. And so, and so what we come to understand, what's important for us to understand, is that when we go to the Bible, the Bible is not designed, or the word of God is not designed for me to bring my ideas to it, to say this is what it's saying. No, I have to objectively read what God says in his word and take out of what he said from his word to give me the answer that I need for everything in life. And so the bottom line is, no matter what we need, there's an answer for us in the word of God. So anybody, anybody yet, Tim? As far as, okay, all right. First question. Thank y'all so much. We have a question from, the, uh, from our inbox. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how does God view um, mental illness from the point of view of a believer who eventually commits suicide and takes their own life. Wow. How does God view mental illness from that perspective? Listen, here's, 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 here's how we have to work, work, work through it, if you will. First of all, um, go, to, go to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, that's a, that's a wonderful thing that God says. He says to us, you know, when Moses was saying, you know, he couldn't talk. And Moses was saying, you know, I don't, I don't, know, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, uh, but the Lord, this is what the Lord said in, in, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. He says, so the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? And again, we're talking about, in this case, we're talking about a physical impediment. But, but I, I, in, in, in reality, what we say is that God made everyone. And I think the question that we're, we're addressing is, is that in life sometimes what can happen, a person can experience, if you will, a, a chemical imbalance in the brain, in, in their mind. And a person's mind could literally be altered. But it doesn't change the fact God made that person. So he says, uh, verse 12, I'm, at, I'm in Exodus chapter 4. Now, therefore, go 
He says to Moses, I will be, be your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But the key is what God says in verse 11. Who has made man's mouth? Who makes the mute? Who makes the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, when it comes to the issue of salvation, um, uh, so we say God made human beings, and the reality is that some, be, some human beings can experience uh, what I, what I, again, I'm going to say a, a chemical imbalance. But so what we're presuming now is that this is a person who could understand, who has the ability to understand the things of God. And that's one of the things you have to keep in mind. Uh, I, I, I always appreciate that uh, Dr. John MacArthur said this once, that many times, you know, we look at people of uh, human beings and we talk about a, a age, an age of accountability. You know, at a certain age, we look at a, at a person becoming responsible, if you would, for their actions, for the things that they do. Uh, but doc, Dr. MacArthur uh, has, has done a, just a wonderful work, and if you wanted to, you know, go to Grace to You uh, and read that, it would be, be a good study to, to be able to read it. But he talks about a stage of accountability, a stage of accountability, meaning this, that it's difficult for a child, if you will, to intellectually understand the ramifications of what it means to be saved, to trust in the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, they can come to understand it at a certain age or a certain stage of life. But he also talked about the stage of a person who uh, may, may have a mental incapacity. That is a stage of life. That is, is a person who, who intellectually cannot understand, if you will, the ramifications uh, of, of what it means again to understand what it means to be saved. So now we keep that in mind that there are people that God have made and there are some again who have chemical imbalances. There are some who just have a certain mental uh, 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 incapacity that, that, in, that keeps them from being able to understand some things so that, so that it's difficult, again, to present the gospel to that individual that they could understand, first of all, their own sins and understand what the need of Jesus as their Savior. So now, when we go to the issue of salvation, we know it comes only one way, right? Um, salvation is based upon grace uh, uh, through faith, right? Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So how, do we, how are we saved? If we are saved by salvation, by believing in the gospel, and the gospel is understanding what? The life the death, the burial, the resurrection, and ultimately the return of Jesus Christ. That's what's inclusive in the gospel. But what's needed in order for us to be saved? We have to believe Christ died in our place, Christ was buried, and Christ was risen from the dead. And we believe that, and the Bible says that when we believe that, then he reminds us that we are all, when he was crucified, we were crucified with him. When he was raised, we were raised with him. So therefore, that's what constitutes our salvation. It is putting our trust, our faith, our confidence, our belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary that he died as a substitute for our sins. He actually satisfied the wrath of God that was against you and I and as a result, now we believe that, so we are saved. Now, as a result of being saved, we work, all right? We're saved by faith, but then we work out our faith. We work out what we believe concerning Jesus Christ. Someone asked the question, okay, what about when a believer, and I think that's the question is dealing with, uh, a believer now commits suicide. Oh, wow. Well, here's the deal. Here's what you understand. Long before the action of suicide, there had to be acts of faithlessness. Long before the act of suicide, there had to be acts of lack of faith in God. What I mean by that is that a person would choose, you re, well, remember what we just talked about, the importance of the word of God. And when we go to the word of God, we learn about God, how powerful God is, how, how, how strong God is, how faithful God is, how trusting God is, how reliable God is. We read in scripture where the Bible would say to us, with God there's 
nothing impossible. He can do anything. But what happens now is a believer can make a decision. At some point, I finally got the problem. I got the problem that God can't handle. As a matter of fact, my problem is bigger than a dead Jesus. I understand. I'm saying as a believer, I know he raised Jesus. I have no doubt about that. I know he, he, he died for my sins. I know he got up on the third day. I believe all of that. But that individual now, for whatever reason, lack of study of the word of God, lack of uh, being in community with other believers, uh, lack of sometimes reaching out to somebody else to say, hey, man, I'm going through. You know, you know let's just kind of talk about that just a little bit for, you know, right where we are. Listen, folk, uh, God, God doesn't trip because you say you're afraid of the coronavirus. God is not tripping. God, God is not like, oh, I can't believe my child is saying that. No, God is not alarmed by any of our emotions, uh, any of our concerns. Uh, there are things that sometimes just overwhelm us. God don't trip when we question him. Like some people say, you, you know, I don't question God. I tell folk all the time, I'm always questioning God because I know he the one got the answer, so I'm questioning him. I never question whether or not he can, but I do question him because I want an answer for whatever <laughs> I'm seeking, right? So who best to go to than God? So now, what happens when a believer stops going to church? What happens when a believer stops uh, 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 reaching out to another believer to say, hey, man, I am really struggling right now. I'm having a hard time right now. Listen, I am a pastor of nearly 30 years, and there are some times uh, my wife would tell you, I act like I ain't got no sense. I mean, it's like, it's like, what in the world? What's, what's up with this dude? What's, what's up with this man? And she'll say, uh, man of mine, what's going on? You know, and, 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 I, and I sort of know what, what's happening at that moment, you know, that I'm doing some stuff that really just ain't making any sense. I'm not talking the way I ought to be talking. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not reaching out to her and just trying to find, I'm, I'm saying things that just don't add up, if you will. Uh, and so now, uh, uh, in, 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 those, in those situations and circumstances, she has a way of reminding me. She has a way of reminding me, hey, you, you know, I mean, you know, have you, have you been reading? Have you been praying? So, so what I'm saying, a believer can come to the point that they stop doing those kinds of things. You know, stop uh, uh, wanting to reach out to, to another believer to say, I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time. This is a difficult time for me. Uh, there are some buddies that I reach out to. I'm telling you, I mean, because I, I love my God knows I love my wife. But every now and then, wow, man, uh, I'm just not understanding some things. So. I got guys that I call. I say, hey, man, I need you to help me. I need you to get me straight, get me back on track in terms of what I... So a believer can literally go through a point whereby they stop doing the things that have been commanded in the word of God and for a moment will make the decision aside to say, I'm checking out of here. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I don't see how I can get myself out of this situation. I don't see how God is going to make a way. It can say all of those kinds of things. And watch this, and we say that, that person commits suicide. And I know what somebody's saying right now. Well, that person going to hell, Lee Skinner, I'm telling you they not. I am telling you based on the word of God, are they going to forfeit rewards? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 lays that out so clearly for us. Um, because it talks about the foundation that God has given us, which is the foundation of Jesus Christ. In verse 11, it says, Now, if one builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work for what it is. Notice what he says. If anyone's work, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he, he, watch this, will suffer loss. But notice to the language, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So yeah, this is what happens. A person trusts God. They believe in Jesus Christ. They are saved on the basis of their belief. 
Now they work because they are saved, but at some point in life, they begin to fail to do those things that keep us engaged, those things that keep us strong as believers. Listen, I'm going to just say this, going through this pandemic right now, this is not the time to stop doing church. This is not the time to not do, try to do live streaming with your church. Try to do conference calls with your church. This is not the time that when a pastor's trying to call you or a deacon trying to call you that you're not answering your phone. This is the time to be more engaged than you ever could be because you need, we need one another in these times. So a believer can come to the point, I'm checking out. But the Bible clearly says that works will burn but they themselves, I'm going to say it again, if you read it, if you didn't, don't, don't tear this page out of your Bible, please don't do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Listen, there's a whole lot of folk don't won't even commit suicide, but there's a whole lot of people that we know right now that can choose to live, that although we're saved, can choose to live like we're not saved. That There's a whole lot of Christians who are doing a lot of cussing right now, a lot of profanity right now. There are a lot of Christians who, who are not operating in the home like we ought to be operating, mad at the children, screaming, hollering, mad at everybody. Don't, oh my God, don't let President Trump come up for his conference. Oh my God, just call him all kinds of names. Listen, that's bad works, and that stuff will burn when we get to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. That stuff don't count with God, but the Bible is still saying that we're going to be saved. Am I sitting here condoning suicide? Never, ever. I'll never say that is okay. I'll never say it's right. Just like I won't say adultery is right. I won't say lying is right. I won't say stealing is right. I won't say speeding in my car is right. I'll never say that. But what I will say is that salvation is based on faith alone and Christ alone. And our works are going to be judged at the Bama seat of Christ. And those who choose to commit suicide are going to forfeit rewards, but their soul can still be saved. Any other question? All right, here we go. Thank y'all for calling. I'm loving this. Uh, what are the pros and cons of elder rule in the church versus an individual pastor-led church? Wow, the pros and cons of elder rule in the church versus, all right, well, again, I think the best way to, you know, Paul lays it out in, in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy, um, um, in terms of the responsibility, uh, if you will, uh, that he has for the, uh, the pastor, uh, as, as we refer to it. Um, faithful saying, we know the qualifications have to be met, right? 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 1 through 7, the qualifications are given uh, for the, uh, the pastor, um, gives the qualifications again in, in verse 8 through 13 for the, uh, the deacon, and not only for the deacon, but also for his, 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 uh, his wife, if you would, that person uh, who would, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the wife of the, of the deacon, because it's possible for a man to be a deacon uh, whose wife is, quote, unquote, not a deaconess, but she has to meet the criteria in order for him to meet the criteria of being a, a deacon. Uh, but then he also reminds us in, in chapter 5, verse 17, let the elders, the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation again against an elder except from two or three witnesses, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. So the Bible is, does teach us about the, if you will, the plurality of elders. And the reason that's important is because you hear that language as far talking about the elders in the church. And the reason being is because of what Paul says back in, um, in to Timothy in, in chapter 3, verse 14. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write to you 
that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pill and ground of the truth, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was just, he was manifested in the spirit, just, I'm sorry, he was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. So it's important again, we talk about the, 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 as the plurality of elders, knowing that there was more than just one elder, if you would, as it relates to the church. We're also reminded in 1 Peter, uh, Peter says it in 1 Peter chapter 5, um, to the elders, he says, who are among you, I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partake of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Absolutely. So the Bible clearly is teaching us about, a quote, unquote, the plurality, if you would, of elders. But he does make a distinction. I'm going back just for a moment to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Notice, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. And so, yes, so there is going to be. Uh, the, the elders, in a, sen- in, no, in a very real sense, have the rule over the church. And I believe that a church functions better in the plurality of elders, basically because what, what the whole idea is, is that when you look at just the model that God had given, going all the way back to Exodus 18. And if those of you want to turn that, you can. I'm just paraphrasing. But in Exodus 18, you have a situation of, uh, of Jethro, who was Moses' father-in-law. Uh, when, 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 when Moses, you know, children of Israel come, they're headed toward the promised land uh, and the like, and, 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 and Jethro joins in with Moses, and he's watching Moses one day. Watching, well, Moses, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, uh, I, I've got the command that I got from God. I got the Ten Commandments that have come from God, and then those 613 ways that that word can be applied, whether it's by commandments, by law, by statute, by testimony, by precepts, by ordinances, all of those things that God has given us in his word. He said, now I, the people bring the problems to me and I deal with them. And so Jethro look at him in Exodus 18 and he said, Moses, the way you're doing this, bro, ain't healthy. He said, no, no, no. So here's what you need to do. You need to find men who are spiritual men, watch this, elders in a very real sense, who can share this responsibility with you. And they were over a certain group of people, an amount of people. Again, Exodus chapter 18. It's all laid out there. I'm not turning to it, but I'm, I'm paraphrasing from Exodus chapter 18. So now, he says, but the weightier matters bring them to me. So now, what we understand in the church, we have, we have elder rule whereby there are a group of men who come together to, to discuss, if you would, the spiritual matters of the church. Things that need to be done as it relates to doctrine. What do we teach in the church? Uh, so that we don't move to heresy where we're saying things that God is not saying in his word. Uh, elder rule helps out uh, with, uh, with the fact that it doesn't allow for a person, if you would, uh, to become uh, a, 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 a dictator, as Peter would, uh, would, would, would allude to uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, recognizing that we, we're, we're, we're not, to be, uh, not to be lords, he says in, in verse 3, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being, in, being examples to the flock. So now there's a, there's a person there, there's a, as, an, as far as elders are concerned, that help with accountability and the like. However, the truth of the matter is that when it comes down to it, amongst the elders, there needs to be one who, who is worthy of double our honor, he would say, especially those who teach and preach the word. So, yes, there has to be, there will be this, this, this individual who, who has the greater responsibility, if you would, as the pastor, if you would, of the church. It's not a situation, again, of, of, of four or five elders are making, you know, a, a sense whereby everybody is 
doing the same thing as it relates to leading from a standpoint of how God would have any, an individual to give direction to a church. But the other elders are there to, just to keep the accountability, to keep it from getting to be something other than what God would have it to be. So the weightier matters now are brought, they were brought to Moses, who was quote unquote pastor, if you would, uh, of, the, of the group. So there is, in the plurality of elders, the accountability that's there, the, the protection from heresy, the ability to work through spiritual matters, but at the same time that there is this person who stands as, quote, unquote, the lead to that church congregation that is identifiable to, to, the, to the entire group that that is pastor. Uh, so, yeah, that's the quote, unquote, the pros. I don't see no really the cons. I don't see where there's a bad side to the plurality of elders. As long as the, 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 the men who are, who are operating operate from the standpoint of not egotism, uh, not operating from pride, uh, not operating from the standpoint, I want to have it my way, from operating from the standpoint, you know, hey, I know as much as he know and all of that. If it's got to be that kind of thing, that's not healthy. But if it's understood that there is, there is, there is, you know, uh, uh, here, here at Good Shepherd, for those of you that know, Pastor Johnson is an, is an elder. <clears throat> Dion was here. Dion was an elder of our church. Uh, right now, the hope is, is that going to be some others that we will ordain that will be elders of our church. But guess what? You can ask a four-year-old child who the pastor. They're going to say, him? And I'm, I'm, just, I'm talking about me, my big head and the like. They know who I am. But there is, there is the equality that's there in terms of our responsibility, our, our accountability, but there is a distinction in terms of um, uh, that person that God, that point person that God will use to give direction to the entire body as it relates to, uh, to the church. 1 Peter 5, 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, 1 Timothy 5, Exodus 18 are the examples that we have. Any other questions? All right then, come on. Wonderful, thank y'all. Who offered strange fire in their censers before God and were killed as a resort of their sin? Oh, my goodness. They offered strange fire. Wow. I like that. I know that's in the, it's in the book of Exodus. I know it's in the book of Exodus. I got to matter. I, I, I know it was Aaron's sons, uh, but I, I've got to I've got to look up the passage. Oh, uh, uh, my goodness. I know the passage. I know it. Y'all bear with me. I'm, I'm going to find it. These were, these were the sons of Aaron who, uh, who offered the, uh, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was the fire that they weren't, what was, it, what was it called, Jamal? What was it called? The strange fire? A strange fire. That's it. Y'all bear with me just a moment. I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember his son's names. Wow. Was it Nadab and Abihu? That's it. That's it. Nadab and what? It, what, 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 what chapter is that? Somebody already found it. So that's what I'm saying. I'm, I don't act like I know all the answers, but I know the answers in the Bible. Exodus 30. That's it. It's, I'm, I'm right at one page. Exodus chapter 30. That's it. One page. Um, and he, and here, is, here is what was happening. Here's what was... Uh, no, Exodus chapter 30 is where we actually get the... Uh, the instructions on what they were to do. And you said Nadab, right? Give me just a moment. Nadab, and what was the other's name? Abihu. Abihu. Uh, Abahu, that's it. Nadab and Abahu. Bear with me just a moment. I just, I got to give me a little, a little help right here. Nadab and Abahu. Um, wow. Let me see. Let me see. Nadab, that's it. We go to Exodus chapter, chapter 28. He become a priest. Um, Leviticus 10 uh, would help us to see that. Uh, yes, yeah. Exodus 28. He was, again, he was the eldest son of, uh, of, uh, of Moses. And we see that in chapter 6. Um, took part in the covenant in chapter 24. Becomes a priest in 28. Let's go to, let's go to Leviticus. Let's look at Leviticus. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. That's where I need to go. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, which took the censer and put fire in it, 
put incense on it, offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, but they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Oh, my goodness, this is so important. And before all people, I must be glorified. So Aaron, Aaron held his peace. Uh, then Moses called Mishael and Elizaphon, the sons of Uzael, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brethren uh, from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, as Moses said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons, Do not uncover they your heads, nor fear your clothes, nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But all your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewailed the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door, the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. But it's because, again, they did not, they, they had the responsibility as the priests uh, in terms of into the holy of holies. They had the responsibility of making sure that the incense was all, always burning in the temple. But in this case, what we have, Nadab and Abihu, uh, the, the Bible says they took that censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered prof- It was not with, with the, the elements that God had prescribed that they use. It was not with the elements that God had appointed for them to use. It was not with the elements that God had commanded them to use. And so, therefore, they presented to God something. Watch this. They presented to God what they wanted God to have. It will be no different. Notice, no, notice what they're, they're literally doing. When you go back to Genesis, uh, in Genesis chapter 5, you know, when we, when we read the story of, uh, of, uh, of Cain and Abel, um, what we do know, that was an attempt, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 4, that was an attempt on Cain's part to offer to God what he wanted God to have. Basically saying to God, you're going to have to take this. But God, God was demonstrating that he didn't have to do it. So notice, notice what, what, what happens. It says in verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn, this Genesis chapter 4, uh, of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, notice the language, if you do well, if you do what what I told you to do, if you offer to me what I told you to offer to me, if you give to me what I commanded you to give to me, he says, will it not be accepted? And if you do well, uh, if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and is desirous for you. And, 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 and you should rule over it. So, so what's, what is a good application for us? Going back to Leviticus 10, you know, where they offered God the profane fire. They gave to God what they wanted God to have. It was not based upon the incense that God had prescribed. It was not at the time that what they offered to God, what they wanted God to have. And as a result, what God is saying, I do not have to accept it. And, and brothers and sisters, that's one of the things that I think is important for us to under, understand. Um, and I'm just using this just as a, as a practical, because I like the question and I'm thinking through the question. You know, one of the things that God has determined for us is that we meet together as a church. We're to meet together as the church. We're to gather together as the church. And the reason we do that is when you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible, Paul styles the body of Christ as as members of one another. He says we're, we're, we're many members, but we're one body. So now, uh, that's important always to keep in mind, since we are the body of Christ, it means that all of our body is all diametrically connected, and an, an, anatomically, we're all connected. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever had one part of your body to hurt and you went to the doctor? And, uh, and when you went to the doctor, here's my question. Which, which part of your body didn't go with you? Huh. 
Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My whole body had to go, even though one part of my body was hurting, or one my part of my body was ill, one part of my body had disease, one part of my body has had sickness. So I had to, but I had to take my whole body there because we are tied to one another. And the other thing that the, that the Bible clearly teaches us, and uh, again, and I'm, and I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is the importance again of understanding because we are the body of Christ, we also have gifts that have been given, right, to each one of us. So those gifts are designed to what? To help the entire body grow. First Corinthians uh, chapter 12, the diversities of gift. I'm, I'm at reading at verse uh, 4. Diversities of gift, but the same spirit. Differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But notice this. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for what? The profit of all. For, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of, of healings by the same spirit, right? So the spirit gives us the gifts that we have in order that the entire body of Christ may grow. He says the same thing to us uh, or reminds us of that in Ephesians chapter 4. That he's what he says in verse 11. And he himself, meaning God, has given Christ has given some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saint, for the work of the ministry, for what? The edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Watch this. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what it says is that each of us in the body need each of us in the body for us to grow. There's not one person in, in the Good Shepherd Church. There's not one person in any other church. If anybody that's listening right now, there's not one person in your church you, that you can say, I don't need you. Each of us in the body need one another. So now, when this pandemic is over, and listen, we are getting used to this social live streaming, all of that sort of thing. But when this pandemic is over and we have the opportunity to start gathering together uh, in the place where we gather together, at the addresses we gather together, in our particular address, 7818 Bonash Street, when, we, when, when that's open for us to do that, it is important for us to do what we're supposed to do. Because now you can't say, listen, I'm just going to have church live streaming. I'm just going to have church the way we've been having it for the, about, about the last three, four, four months. I'm going to have church like that. That has been working for me. That is not going to be offering to God what's, what he wants from you. He wants your body. He wants your gift. He wants what you bring to the body of Christ to be demonstrated in the body of Christ so that all of us who are in the body of Christ, in a local church anyway, for all of us to be able to grow from one another based upon the spiritual gift that he has given us. You can't do your spiritual gift at home watching television. You can't do your spiritual gift at home live streaming. When it's time for us to gather, it's going to be important for us to do that. So that's just, just one of those small applications to what they were doing in Leviticus 10, trying to offer to God what they wanted God to have rather than offering to God what he commanded. Is it any more? Any more? Oh, any, any questions on the call? Any questions on the call? Remember, if you got a question on the call, all you got to do is press star six, and you can ask your question. Any questions on the call? You can press star six and ask your question. I got to tell y'all, I'm having a ball with this. And I have to say it to Stefan and Zach, thank y'all so much, man, for providing this opportunity. Yes, please. Next question. When it comes to the tribulation period, for those who uh, died as unbelievers, will they, have a t will they have an opportunity to repent and be saved? Wow. Wow. Again, when it comes to the tribulation period. Okay, now keep in mind, we, well, we already addressed it. Uh, what's needed for salvation? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Is not of yourself, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast, correct? All right, so that's clear to us. Salvation comes by faith alone in Christ alone. Now, here is, uh, here is what we're waiting on. You know, the next, the next big thing, well, we'll say it this way. Let, 
let me, let me back up a little bit. God started his program in terms of, he did it with the patriarchs. He started with, with, uh, with, uh, with Adam, Noah. Uh, we look at uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, then after Jacob, he established a nation. So in terms of him revealing himself through human beings, that has always been the means that he's done it. Uh, you go to Romans chapter 4. Uh, the Bible clearly says, and even, I'm, talking, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Genesis 15 or Romans chapter 4, it would say that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, all right? So faith alone in Christ alone is always the means for salvation. I have to believe what God says about himself. I have to believe what God says I need to believe about him in order for me to be saved. And when I say saved, I'm talking about the fact that uh, according to Romans chapter 5, when we come into the world, we all come, we all come as sinners who is in need of a savior. Uh, and so now uh, I must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I must believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ for my, my personal salvation, correct? So now that has been done uh, in terms of God revealing himself, he's been doing that now through what we call the church of Jesus Christ. He did it through the nation of Israel. Now he's doing it through the church of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there is going to come a time that he's going to take the church out of here. Oh, yeah, he's going to take the church out of here. And, and, and that's described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, beginning at verse 13. And no, normally that's one of those passages that we, we normally hear whenever there's a funeral. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Christ, that Jesus died and rose again, uh, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For in this, in this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Remember, there's always been this expectation that Jesus said he was going to leave, but he was coming back. Uh, John 14, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, but I'm going to come again and I'll receive you to myself, right? Uh, that we who are alive and remain uh, to the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend uh, in heaven, from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Ooh, I like that word, caught up. Fancy word in Greek, harpazo. Say that with me, harpazo. I love that word, harpazo. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So what he's t showing us, that God in this church age, for the most part, is including, if you would, I'm going to say it this way, primarily Gentiles. Gentiles. Yes, there are a lot of Jews uh, we call them, we refer to them as Messianic Jews, and I don't know if that's a good term, but they're saved. They're Christians just like we are. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that he's going to return just like anyone else, which is necessary for salvation. So based on that, they are Christians. They are followers of Jesus Christ. They're believers in Jesus Christ. So therefore, they are saved, all right? So now, but we know predominantly all over the world, it's primarily gen more Gentiles, if you would, that God is dealing with right now. But we're reminded when you go back to Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 12, he says that Israel's rejection, even though they rejected him as Messiah, Jesus as Messiah when he first came, um, God has still included them in his plan. So if you read, and if you get an opportunity, if you would read uh, uh, all of uh, Romans chapter 11, it's going to help to understand how God now has put a delay, if you would, to some degree on, on, on uh, the Jews, but they're going to be included back in. Israel is going to be included back in into his, his plan. <clears throat> he says it this way at verse 11. I say then, Romans chapter 11, they have, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their, through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So what it's saying, that God is going to restore Israel. That's why we got to keep praying for the nation, nation of Israel. I think one of the reasons that God keeps blessing America is because of the ties that we still have with the nation of Israel. Um, and so, and so he's saying to us that they're going to be restored. He's going to restore the temple. 
David is going to be back on the throne. All of that kind of thing is going to happen. And that's, you know, that's in what we call the millennial kingdom. But right, so right now, we're waiting for the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church, what happens is that this is going to usher in what we call the tribulation period. So uh, Matthew chapter 24 is where we, Matthew well, 23, 24, 25, is where we really deal with those issues. So uh, here's, notice what Jesus says. Uh, I'm at verse uh, 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Matthew 24, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, I will and deceive men, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom is against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up for tribulation. He's reminding, because it started off with them asking Jesus the question. Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So now watch this. Right now, predominantly, when we go back to Romans chapter 11, he is dealing with the revelation of who God is, saving people through Jesus Christ, Primarily, it's the Gentiles, but he's going to do bring the, Jew, the, the Israelites back up again, raise them up as a nation. Um, that's going to usher in in, ter- in terms of, of uh, that, that, that's the, the millennial period, but prior to that is going to be the tribulation period. But understand, most of the people, most of the people, most of the people that are going to be saved uh, uh, need to be saved right now because when the tribulation comes, uh, and he starts dealing with all of the plagues and the like of Revelation uh, that starts at Revelation 7 all the way through to Revelation 19. Uh, when he starts to deal with all of those issues, it's primarily Jews. Now, are some people are going to be saved in the tribulation? Yeah. Uh, that's the purpose of the 144,000. There are going to be some that are going to be saved. And it's going to still be the same way. They must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It will still be the same thing. It must be by the power of the Holy Spirit. But unfortunately then, according to, uh, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Holy Spirit is not going to no longer be restraining sin as he's doing right now. Listen, folks, y'all think COVID-19 is bad. Yeah, we think... The, uh, the pestilence and the plagues of, of 1918 that lasted until 1920. We think those things were bad. We hear about the world wars that have transpired in the last uh, 100 years. We hear about all of those things. That, those were some terrible times uh, for planet Earth. But it's nothing compared to the tribulation that God has planned for this earth. Uh, when, when the Bible says that Jesus is going to be given the title deed to this earth and say, hey, do what you want with it. And that's going to be pestilence, and that's going to be plagues, and that's going to be, that's going to be death in, in manners that we never, ever even imagined. Um, so, 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 yes, people are going to be saved. But I'm saying if you're a Gentile right now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ right now, it doesn't matter if, you, what, if you're a human being right now. Right now is the time to trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Right now is the time to recognize him, to allow him to be the Lord of your life. Because you're seeing many of the things that the Bible predicts, we're, we're experiencing some of that right now. We're seeing some of those things going on right now. Notice again, in verse, I'm, talking, I'm just going with verse 7. Nation will rise against nation. That's happening right now. Kingdom against kingdom. That's happening right now. There are going to be famines happening now. Pestilence happening now. Earthquakes happening now. All of this stuff is happening right now. But notice what he told us. Those are just the beginning of sorrow. So if you're already looking in a world that is falling, you're looking at a world where there is a lot of sickness, a lot of disease, a lot of illness, a lot of sadness, a lot of things that make people cry, a lot of things that hurt people. If that's what's happening now, and this is only the beginning, so you can only imagine what tribulation is going to be. Now watch this. The tribulation is going to last three and a half years. Then he says, then it's going to be great tribulation. (laughs) For another three and a half years, another 42 months. Because what's going to be happening is that God's wrath is going to be, it's going to be put on this world. Folk, understand, and I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm closing when I share this. God created us. 
And God, as our creator, has the right to rule. And the tribulation period will be where God will say, I have given man every opportunity. I've given man every chance. I've given man, I've made this thing as simple as I can make it, that, I'm, that I will put my son, Jesus Christ, I will allow my son to die on a cross for the sin of every human being. And all I'm saying to that human being is to trust in my son, Jesus Christ, as your savior. I'm saying to you to trust, give your life to my son, Jesus Christ. And, and, and I promise that your sins will be forgiven. I promise to give you eternal life. Listen, I'm not promising that you won't have a life with pain and sorrow. You're going to have it. But if you will trust my son as a personal savior, I'm also promising you eternal life. And in eternal life, uh, he reminds us in, uh, in Revelation chapter 21, he said, there's going to come a time there'll be no more sorrow. Matter of fact, I'm, I want to close on that today, just reading that passage, just as a word of encouragement to any of you that are listening here today. Uh, with all of the issues that are going on in our world, with all of the problems that are going on in our world, he, here is what the word of God. Remember, I started off by talking about the word of God, not by private interpretation. Lee Skinner didn't come up with this on his own. Your pastor didn't come up with this on his own. Notice what the word of God says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21, and we'll be closing. For the first heaven and the first earth that passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Come, Jesus. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Uh, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, as I'm doing right now. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. We can count on the fact that if you're saved today, if you trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, this is the promise. God, God, God has made to you and there is going to come a time that crying is going to be gone. Disease is going to be gone. Sickness is going to be gone. Pain is going to be gone. But it comes with right now. Put in your trust, your faith, your confidence in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you haven't trusted him today, today would be a good day to do that. The word says, for by faith you've been saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of works. Let's say any man should boast. So if you haven't trusted in Christ Jesus today, you can. But what do you have to believe? You have to believe he died. You have to believe he lived. You have to believe he died. You have to believe he was buried in a grave. You have to believe God raised him from the dead. And the Bible says you can be saved. You will be saved. You shall be saved. But for those of you that fail to trust him, the end, the end, the end that God has planned for those who choose to reject his son is, is not something I would wish on the worst of enemies. So my brothers and sisters, today is the day. Now is the time. Right now would be a good time to trust Jesus as your personal savior because tomorrow there's no guarantee for you. So if you haven't trusted him, you can. Um, just by way again of information for as our church is concerned, if you want to call, um, talk about some of the things we talked about today, our number is 713-672-9847, 713-672-9847. Um, we love you all, Good Shepherd. Men, look forward to uh, sharing with you all tonight at 7. Keith will have a special word for us, and we look forward to that. Until we meet again, my prayers that God continue to bless and keep all of us. We pray in some way this was edifying and helpful for you for the rest of your day, for the rest of your week, for the rest of your life that God will allow you on planet earth. Until then, until we meet again, let's love one another. Serve as God has called for us to serve. Good shepherd, let's stay connected, stay communicating with each other. I love you. 
God bless you.